So it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about work from the Stanford Kidney Cancer Research Group. And um, I'm an instructor in medical oncology. So we're all in this room because we need answers at every step of cancer care. For kidney cancer, we know there's something that happens at tumor initiation, and very often that's loss of VHL, which leads to dysregulation of the hypoxia signaling pathway, an increase in HIF, VEGF, and angiogenesis. Then the tumor cells grow large enough so that they're diagnosed, and usually that's incidentally nowadays on a CT scan um, done for some other reason. And then they go to surgery if they have localized disease. Um, but for the unfortunate patients who recur or those that are metastatic at presentation, we have to select our first treatment. And when we do that, there are now, luckily, seven approved drugs that target hypoxia and mTOR kinase <coughs> pathways. And of the five that are first line, we don't really know which one to give first. And we choose it based on our best um, guess. And then something happens to the patient's cells. They may respond. We may be turning down the pathway. We're not really sure until the first imaging at 8 to 12 weeks after treatment. And sadly, up to 25% receive no benefit from their treatment, and they've had um, side effects without response. So what we need are proteomic biomarkers to quantify targets and downstream, si downstream signaling inhibition upon treatment initiation so that we can try and find out much sooner rather than waiting 8 to 12 weeks what's happening at the proteomic level for these patients. And these patients are receiving therapies, as you can see on the figure, that either are inhibiting receptor kinases or small molecules that inhibit the kinases up and down the pathways. And you can see some of the key players. This is a highly simplified version of, of the pathways involved, but you can see that we need to be able to measure downstream changes in PI3 kinase, AKT, mTOR, as well as RAS-RAF through MEC and ERK to understand if the therapies are actually hitting their targets or not earlier. Now, there's several barriers that we were talking around the lunch table, even, that have inhibited the development of proteomic biomarkers. First, it requires invasive procedures to provide enough tissue for analysis. The gold standard for Western is a Western blot, which usually requires about a million cells for one measurement. And that's just not tenable to take a patient through multiple surgeries just to see what's happening with their tissue. Things like that are standard in clinical practice, like immunohistochemistry and flow cytometry to look at proteins, require many processing and staining steps. And each step um, can be, uh, due to um, human error, can be less and less precise. And so you get a qualitative measure, not a highly quantitative measure of the proteins. And lastly, we're talking about looking at activation of proteins. And we have to measure the phosphorylations. And complex phosphorylations are very difficult to measure unless you have phospho-specific antibodies. And we don't have phospho-specific antibodies for every single phosphorylation. So to answer these questions, we've developed the use of a new nanoimmunoassay, which I'll describe on the next slide. It's abbreviated NIA, to distinguish and quantify multiple proteins and their modifications in patient cells. The NIA allows rapid analysis of very small amounts of tissue, such as fine needle aspirates or cells from blood, and it's a capillary-based microfluidic instrument that's commercially available called the NanoPro 1000. And in this instrument, the proteins are separated by charge. So a very small amount of charge difference, like a single phosphorylation, will focus in a different part in this microcapillary. And what makes it nano is that the input requires only four nanoliters of lysate. So you can take a fine needle aspirate, flash freeze it, minimize its processing steps, and then process it for analysis. So it decreases processing steps and it decreases human error. Once we have the proteins lined up based on charge, you use antibody detection. And what you get is, like on the bottom, a waveform where the area under each curve is the amount that's present of phosphorylated and unphosphorylated isoforms. So we get very high resolution, and for the first time, we can see date changes in even monophosphorylated isoforms that we couldn't even see before because we don't have antibodies to them. Luckily, it's automated, so it's near real time. We get a result in four hours. So this is just a partial list of some of the assays that we've been developing, and particularly for hypoxia signaling, we've been looking at things like CA9, HIF, VEGFR, as well as up and down the MAP kinase and, and PI3 kinase pathways. And we've shown that changes in specific phosphoisoforms occur with successful targeted treatment in two clinical contexts so far. First, we published in 2009 that a monophosphorylated ERK2 isoform predicts response of patients with chronic myelogenous leukemia to imatinib. And a second one is, uh, was with a clinical trial of regurgitib, which is a PI3, kin uh, PI3 kinase inhibitor and a polo-like 1 kinase inhibitor. And that's still in clinical trials. We've found in patients with myelodysplastic syndrome that a very specific phospho-ERK isoform 
decreased in patients that had clinical benefit. So now we're using NIA to profile kidney cancer. And this is um, a photograph of one of the samples that we got. So we get the kidney from the OR and we bivalve it. And then we can directly visualize areas of normal kidney tissue, like the blue dot, and um, areas of hypoxia in areas that um, are, are very good specimen. And we take samples of all of them so we can start addressing what's different from the normal tissue and, um, and how the tumor may have intratumoral heterogeneity. So the goal is to measure activation of hypoxia pathways to determine the presence of RCC and, and characterize the degree to which different pathways are activated at the proteomic level, and these ex vivo FNAs are obtained under direct visualization. So this is just looking at our monthly case accrual from 2012 to 2013, and we've accumulated samples from greater than 100 patients to date, and that's more than 200 FNAs, several FNAs per patient. And we can see that there was a little drop off in, two, in the summer of 2012 because we were transitioning from pilot funding to an R21, which allowed us to hire our study coordinator, Tommy Metzner, who's in the audience, and we can see that our sample collection has accelerated. Now, the very important questions are, how reproducible is this? Well, we found that there are 100 cells are adequate for analysis, and it's highly reproducible. And we can keep the specimens on ice for up to 60 minutes before we get them to the lab and pellet them. So this is an example of looking at MEC1 phosphorylated and unphosphorylated isoforms, and they don't change over time. We can start to use this in um, overnight profiling. So this is a sample of 20, R RNA, uh, 20 FNAs from RCC specimens. And by the next morning, when we come back to the instrument, we've profiled eight different proteins. And you can see um, that there are very different basal levels of activation of these proteins. In fact, if we look across 200 specimens for ERK-1, for example, we can see that I had to graph this on a log scale because basal set points for each tumor and each pathway can be very different. So it's hard to choose a s one set point that's a threshold above which or below which they're going to respond to a treatment. So this, I think, is some of the difficulty that we have in trying to develop proteomic biomarkers from one time point at surgery. So what we find is that a paired analysis can be more effective, and profiling shows that RCC is highly phosphorylated compared with adjacent non-tumor tissue. So you can see a trace in the upper left corner of an FNA from kidney cancer. It's a clear cell. And the different phosphoisoforms are indicated with the Ps. If we look at the profile of the adjacent non-tumor, it's pretty clear that the phosphorylations are not there. And if we look across panels of head and neck tumors, kidney tumors, adenos, and in sarcomas, we can see that for the kidney tumors, if you take the ratio of tumor phosphorylation to normal, it's always high. But what you also notice is it's not always the same fold difference. It's a very different fold difference. So FNAs of tumor tissue versus adjacent non-tumor tissue are one way we're trying to look at the comparison of activation. Now we have work in progress as well. The goal is to define nanoproteomic signatures to monitor and predict therapeutic response to approved and novel agents. And our approach, as I mentioned, is to profile cells from RCC patients before and much earlier during treatment than the 8 to 12 week time point. And these are patients treated with TKIs, mTOR inhibitors, or building this into new clinical trials of novel agents. And it would be ideal to use minimally invasive techniques to do this. And so we've received an R21 to be able to do this with percutaneous biopsy as well as serial blood specimens where we can analyze cells from blood. And we've accumulated blood on greater than 60 patients to date. So in summary, what I've said is that we can use nanoscale technologies to measure the hypoxia signaling pathway in several numbers of, in small numbers of tumor cells from kidney, pans, kidney cancer patients and other solid tumors, as well as hematologic tumors. And now we're poised to interrogate molecular mechanisms at the proteomic level of tumor initiation and tumor sensitivity and tumor resistance to therapy. And the ultimate goals are to accelerate development of new drugs by selecting patients likely to benefit. We want to get a much earlier sense and not have to wait 8 to 12 weeks before we know if they're receiving benefit. And to define biomarkers of response earlier. And ultimately to personalize therapy for patients, whether it's in the neoadjuvant setting, so we can be courageous and say we're going to put you on this because we can tell it's working as early as one week, or in the metastatic setting as well. So I'd like to thank all of our collaborators. It takes a very large team of people to be able to do this difficult proteomic work, especially my mentor, Dean Felscher, as well as the Kidney Cancer Research Group at Stanford, which is spearheaded by John Leppert, also in the podium, and Sandy Srinivas and Lauren Harshman. Thank you.